I really want to tell people there are hope. Don't give up hope. And I just want to say I'm having, I'm living a great life. I'm working, I'm traveling. I saw my youngest child get married. It's fantastic. Um, but I think the, my message I tell people is that I've been a doctor for uh, over 30 years and I've uh, taken care of a lot of patients. I've read hundreds of thousands of films. I've done thousands of biopsies. I've held a lot of people's hands. I've counseled a lot of people. But ironically, my biggest contribution to medicine is not as a doctor, but it's been as a patient. And ironically, um, then I was diagnosed with lymphoma out of the blue uh, in my late 40s, uh, very much of a shock. So to be on both sides of it, where I'd been taking care of patients and actually both my parents passed away from cancer, uh, different kinds. Uh, and then I, then of course I developed myself. Um, and then navigating the cancer world as both a patient with the background of, of being a physician has been uh, unusual. And that's one of the reasons I'm thankful to be here. I feel like one of my missions is to try to give back, to try to bridge the, the gap between doctors sometimes and patients so that they can learn to talk to each other better and so that patients can learn to advocate for themselves and doctors can perhaps understand where they're coming from. Yeah, thank you for, yeah, definitely thank you for being here and for offering that perspective that is very unique. I mean, this is a personal topic for me as well. Uh, DLBCL is all over my medical charts. Um, I was 31 when I was diagnosed. And then so just like you, Robin, there's that shock. What was it for you that was a red flag that led to the diagnosis? And share a little bit about getting that diagnosis. I had a swollen lymph node, but it was an unusual location. Uh, given my field of cancer uh, detection, I actually had a lymph node in what's called your supraclavicular region, which is you never have normal lymph nodes there. When you have a cold, those don't swell up. Usually when you have a lymph node above your uh, collarbone there, a lot of times it can be a symptom of lung cancer, or gastric cancer, ovarian cancer, or even breast cancer. Um, but I felt a lymph node literally while I was watching TV and I knew it was bad. There's just, it's, it's never good. Uh, so my process for diagnosis went very fast. I ended up with a CT the next day, which I looked at and I found out I had lymphoma because not only did I have this, I had lymph nodes all the way up and down my neck, which you couldn't feel. And I'm actually, I'm not a big person. They were all very small. They were just too many of them. And I actually had some lymph nodes behind my nose and then something called wild arrows ring. And I thought I'd had allergies. I was congested and that actually was lymphoma. Um, so somewhat of, you know, not totally unusual presentation, but the, uh, it, everything went really fast. It was a shock. I mean, I really had no symptoms besides that. I was working 60 hours a week as a mother of three. I ran every day. I ate well. And before I knew it, uh, I had a CT scan, a PET scan, a port put in, and immediately I started on RCHOP, which is the standard therapy. And um, it was initially very successful for me, uh, but uh, that's, we digress. And then I go on to when it did, didn't work later, so first let's start, Dr. Brody, what in as human terms as possible <laughs> um, is diffuse large B cell, DLBCL, and maybe are there some common first red flags or symptoms? So uh, in regular English, lymphoma is a cancer of lymph cells. What are lymph cells? I mean, so this is you know real simple. You think about breast cancer, cancer of breast cells, prostate cancer, cancer of prostate cells. It's a healthy cell that becomes a cancer. So what are lymphocytes? Lymphocytes are a certain type of blood cell um, they are specifically blood cells that may live in your lymph nodes. When you say swollen glands because you had a cold or a sore throat or something, those glands we're talking about are usually lymph nodes. And lymph nodes are all around your body, your neck, under your arms, inside of your abdomen, everywhere, everywhere. So that's the, the first tricky thing because when you think breast cancer, prostate cancer, you think, oh, I know where the breast, the prostate is. And so that makes sense. Lymphoma comes from lymphocytes, which mostly live in lymph nodes. So they could be anywhere in the body. So when we say, what are the sort of common presenting symptoms of lymphoma? Yeah, it depends on which lymph node area had a, a cell become cancerous. Uh, but still amongst uh, all of those possibilities, you know, swollen lymph node in the neck, swollen lymph node under the arm, we still say that the most common presentation is just a painless swollen lymph node. Um, and 
you know, where that is, right, can, can be very variable, literally anywhere in the body. And then there are even subsets of lymphomas that don't even show up in a lymph node per se. Um, sometimes we talk about this primary mediastinal B-cell lymphoma. They are lymph nodes there, but they're not in the common lymph node spots we think of, the neck, the underarms, and so forth. They just show up in the middle of the chest, the mediastinum. But yes, lymph nodes, that are swelling and usually uh, painless, usually, and getting worse over weeks and weeks and weeks. Yes, those need to get evaluated. Those are the most common presenting symptom of diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, which is the most common, or we say the highest incidence type of lymphoma. So uh, Robin, you mentioned RCHOP. Let's, let's go there. Let's talk about standard of care before we go into the clinical trial space. Uh, Dr. Brody, what has been um, the standard first-line treatment in DLBCL? We heard Robin talk about RCHOP, and we also can cover something that's a more recent approval. Yeah, so for the past 20 years, um, you know, maybe there's been a, a bit of an evolution or change in this in, just in the past one year. But for the past 20 years, absolutely, RCHOP has been, uh, we say, the standard of care. It doesn't mean that everyone gets RCHOP, but most people do, probably certainly more than 80%, probably more than 90%. Some people may not get RCHOP maybe because it can uh, be a little tough. So uh, we have patients who are in their 90s and they may get a gentler version of RCHOP or even slight variations of that. Um, we do have patients in their 90s who still get RCHOP, but it's not gentle therapy for a 40-year-old like Dr. Stacey Humphreys was, and it's definitely not gentle therapy for um, someone with two of those 40-year-olds underneath their uh, belt. So uh, we sometimes give gentler versions, and there's sometimes even more aggressive versions. There's a therapy uh, that, Stefan, you definitely know about called REPOC, R-E-P-O-C-H. So you can hear it's all the same letters as RCHOP plus one more letter, the E. And um, Again, it's really just kind of a tougher version of RCHOP. In some ways, it seems to be uh, better in, in that it's maybe more effective, but in a big randomized trial comparing the two, it wasn't a clear difference. So we think that maybe REPOC is just good for certain super high-risk subsets of patients. Um, and so maybe, you know, 5 or 10% of patients, instead of getting RCHOP, might get that REPOC. Um, and yeah, that has, as, as Dr. Stacey Humphrey said, was a big evolution just from the CHOP of the 90s. And you know, easily added a 10 plus percentage increase in the cure rate uh, to standard therapy for these patients with DLBCL. So it's a big, big deal. Uh, actually, I was very lucky because rituximab sort of came out of Stanford and 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 IDEC, Biogen, Gen and DEC uh, back in uh, in the early 2000s. So it was an exciting time for us to have that big, you know, that C transformation, uh, a change in era. We now entered the rituximab era of treating patients with DLBCL. So that was exciting to see. And now we're still seeing maybe comparably exciting evolutions to what may be the standard going forward now. That's amazing. Yeah, and to have all that history and to be front and center when it was all going on, that must have been exciting. And um, you know, speaking of changes, we have a recent approval that, you know, of course, was in clinical trials and then was approved by the FDA, polituzumab or Polivi and our CHIP, which is our CHOP without the O, for first-line treatment. Uh, the question, I think, when these things happen is how much real-world data is there and, and just what are your thoughts uh, about it as another option for people? Exactly that, that, that our CHIP, uh, POLA our CHIP, we say. Uh, is another option. It's not the right answer, but it might be the right answer in the future. We'll see. Um, yeah, the alphabet soup is tough enough when those words are pronounceable, but once you take the O out of CHOP, now it's RCHIP plus polituzumab. Um, harder and harder to pronounce, but uh, but maybe more effective. So there's this big trial, Polarix, a randomized trial. Half of the patients got RCHOP, half of them got POLA RCHIP. And the punchline was that the POLA RCHIP was a bit more effective. Maybe 6% more people stayed in remission for the first couple of years. So it's possible that could you know, eventually translate to an increased cure rate, but it's not that yet. It would need more time to follow those folks and see how they do. But a 6% increase you know, staying in remission for two years, that's not nothing. I mean, if you were one of those six out of 100 people, that'd be a big deal for you. The only catch is it's not you know, for free in that there is some extra side effects, but not, not too bad. It's just that the, the risk of infections during the therapy uh, was moderate, but it was also a bit increased in the polar R chip. Uh, in, interestingly, it was about a 6% increase on that side as well. So maybe 6% more people staying in remission, maybe 6% more people getting this significant side effect. The side effect lands you in the hospital, so it's not nothing. Um, so a little bit uh, tougher on lymphoma, but a little tougher on patients as well. So is it the right therapy? 
I wouldn't say it's the right therapy for everybody, but certainly I, every lymphoma doc is kind of weighing each patient. It's, I mean, it's supposed to be individualized, personalized for this for each patient and saying, yeah, this patient might, you know, do well because they're younger and healthier uh, and wouldn't, you know, have a high risk of side effects. Um, and this patient, you know, may not do well. A 90-year-old probably wouldn't get polar or chip because um, already our chopped is tough therapy for them. Uh, and also maybe for the higher risk patients and maybe certain subsets uh, of the high risk patients might get the most benefit uh, from the polar R chip. So probably in America in the near future, maybe half of patients are going to be getting polar R chip and half of them getting uh, a good old R chop as we go forward. That's great. Thank you for, for sharing that and interesting to hear that sort of, okay, maybe it's half and half. We'll see. So what's the risk of relapse with DLBCL and what is the leading treatment for those who relapse? So Dr. Brody, I'll move to you again um, on this question. Well, as Dr. Stacey Humphrey said, we cure the majority of patients. I mean, this is awesome. I mean, not just compared to the 90s, but you know, compared to the 70s when I had relatives that, uh, that had this disease. Uh, so yeah, we cure the majority of patients. That's wonderful, but it's not 100% and we would like to get it there. Um, so you know, probably today we are curing more than 65% of patients you know, it kind of depends on which study you look at, because a lot of these studies focus actually on slightly younger, slightly healthier patients. And if you look at everybody, it's probably about 65, maybe a little bit above that um, with, you know, standard uh, 2023 therapies. But we also see that increasing as well, even over the next few years from some of the exciting things we're going to talk about. So maybe 35% of patients, about a third of patients could still relapse. And then the standard of care for them, we could talk about it in detail, but in big picture, it actually depends on a few things. But the first thing it depends on is when they relapse. So if patients relapse very quickly, they relapse within the first year after that R-CHOP or whatever they had, uh, the approach is a bit different. The, the idea there is they just got chemo and it didn't work very well. So really giving something that kills cancer in a different way might be better. And that was tested in a big trial, well, a couple of big trials. Uh, the, the TRANSFORM trial and the ZUMA7 trial. And the punchline of those trials were that for those early relapsers, and it also includes people that didn't get a good remission at all, uh, for those early relapsers, and we say refractory patients, CAR T cells, this very cool immunotherapy we're going to talk more about, and there's some personal experience here to talk about as well, uh, CAR T cells were superior to the old standard. The old standard was basically more chemo and actually a lot of chemo, uh, which was tough uh, therapy. So those trials are actually, you know, they were both showing that CAR-T were better. And if you look, you know, sort of read between the lines, they were also, I would say, safer and better tolerated. So that's kind of a rare win-win, you know, both better and safer. We don't get a lot of those, you know, in, in new cancer therapies. I kind of mentioned the polar chip. It was not really a win-win. It was maybe better, but not safer. Uh, this CAR-T versus the old standard of just more chemo, it was a real win-win. So for early relapsers and refractory patients, CAR-T is the standard of care it doesn't mean every patient has to get it. There's still some individualization. But for the early relapsers, that's been the big change over the past year and two. Uh, that was not the standard of care even a couple of years ago. And then for patients uh, whose disease relapses later, um, it's even more individualized. But the old standard for younger patients with late relapses was this more chemo and this sort of, we say, mega dose chemo approach called autologous stem cell transplant Autologous just means you give the stem cells to yourself. It's a little uh, fancy how it works, and we will talk about it, but uh, we just want to distinguish it from this other kind of transplant where you get stem cells from another person. We call that allogeneic stem cell transplant. For people that relapse a little later and they are young and tough enough to tolerate this tough therapy, more chemo and autologous stem cell transplant, that is still the standard. But that doesn't really apply to every patient because, you know, when we did those first studies, they were for people under 60. Then we started doing it for patients under 65. Now we do it for patients under 70. But it's a tough therapy uh, for people who are around the median age of this disease, which is upper 60s and 70s. So uh, it is a standard of care. But a lot of times for those late relapsing patients, uh, they may not be eligible for that approach. So then there's a whole bunch of other, thankfully, nowadays, um, maybe more targeted options that we'll talk about as well. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Birdie. Well then, Robin, you know, with your patient story, you uh, ended up, you know, you had a good response to our chop in the beginning, as you mentioned, it didn't stay that way. We'd love to understand more of what happened. How far along were you until you realized something's not right again? Um, well, I was actually in complete remission for four years. 
And um, my relapse happened when, again, I actually felt a lymph node in my neck, which I knew wasn't supposed to be there. Um, and as uh, uh, Dr. Brody said, um, the standard of care at that point, which was in 2015, um, was to go ahead and get an autologous stem cell transplant. First, they give you something called salvage chemotherapy. Rice is what I received, and there's more initials. Uh, it's a very rough chemotherapy. Um, and then I also got something called intrathecal chemotherapy to prevent uh, the, the lymphoma from coming back in my brain. Um, and then I was confirmed to be in remission, and then they went ahead and did the stem cell transplant. They'd already harvested stem cells, and they ablate your bone marrow using the strongest chemo possible, and then they give you your marrow back, and it's really a rescue. I mean, you have no cell, cells left, and they give you your marrow, and then you have to wait for your marrow to come back. And like many of the people who go through this, the biggest risk is infection, and of course, I actually got something called septic shock, um, where you're in the intensive care unit, very, very sick. Um, on medicines, pressers, et cetera. Uh, so when I survived that, um, in my case, uh, it was decided among several institutions because my case was slightly unusual and everyone does try to do patient-centered care. Um, I ended up getting radiation, which was really horrible. So, uh, you know, two thumbs down, don't recommend, but I'm still here. Um, and so that was my uh, second treatment, but I was very, very sick. I couldn't eat solid food. I dropped uh, from a BMI of 22 down to a BMI of about 15 or 14. Um, it was it was quite difficult. Uh, and then you know I was actually then trying to work. So um, that that was my second experience, and and I just um, it, it wasn't great. But you know you do what you have to do just to survive. And I did get great care. So my doctors were fantastic. It just had some complications. I was in, I was remission for nine months after the, the um, autologous stem cell. And then actually the CAR T, the um, lymphoma came back. At this time, it actually sort of came back even more aggressively because not only was it in my neck, it was underneath my armpit in my groin. That had never occurred before. Um, and at that point, uh, they found out I had no match uh, for an allogeneic transplant um, and no one was even close. And the, the doctors were very shocked about that. But I had already decided I did not want to go through that again. And I had done some research online at www.clinicaltrials.gov. And I did this on my own. Um, and we had started researching other options. And I had heard, you know, things about these T cell therapies, they had talked about killer T cells, CAR T, and it had actually been in the news in 2015, so, or 16. So I started looking into that. And that's how I actually ended up going into a clinical trial. Uh, and I'm very, very grateful I did. It was a phase two trial. It was definitely a leap of faith, but I just had a feeling it was the right thing for me. And I was an excellent candidate because I was in really, really good health, except for the fact I had lymphoma. So for a clinical trial, this is perfect because I had no co comorbidities and that way the doctors could actually figure out, you know, is this going to really work or was there something else that would interfere with the um, procedure? You know, uh, Robin, you went through this. Uh, let's rewind a little bit first. Just, you know, you you are in, you know, you're a physician. So you have, I think, more of a know-how maybe of navigating clinical clinicaltrials.gov or understanding what's in the pipeline. How did you determine that this was what you wanted to do? What was so, um, you mentioned it was a leap of faith and, you know, was it you who brought it up? Was it a, a different doctor who brought it up? Uh, and what was the experience like when you actually went through CAR-T? In a nutshell, uh, my, I decided that I want to do CAR-T because I didn't have an allogeneic match and that would not have gone well. The best, I could have had a haplo match, which is a half match with my son, but uh, I had not done well with the uh, auto stem cell. So I didn't think I was gonna do well, or might, I may not sur have survived an allogeneic stem cell transplant. And I may not have had a normal life. I wanted to have that quality of life. And uh, the theory of CAR-T, I'd read about it um, in some scientific articles and I just Googled this. Nobody really told me anything. Uh, I just thought this made sense. Cause right now the basis of, of cancer therapy is you either cut it, you burn it, or you poison it. Um, so taking your own immune cells is actually, you know, much nicer. It's, uh, you know, lovely as compared to the other ones, even though it has side effects. So 
the, when I did the clinical trials, I really didn't have that much of an insight. I just put in my diagnosis. I found out all the trials and we emailed every single investigator. And that's how I ended up. And the reason I ended up in the trial was it was quite frankly, the only opening that existed. We even looked in Sweden. We looked all over. I was really ready to sell the house and move wherever. Um, so we were lucky to get one about nine hours away. So fast forward, I sign up for CAR-T. It is brand new. I'm the second person at this hospital, huge hospital that gets the, the um, treatment. Um, when they took my T-cells out, uh, then they gave me some, uh, just one chemotherapy agent. I got bendamustine. Some people get flu sci. And then had these T cells infused and they were in like a little 10 CC bag and the infusion took about five minutes and everyone in the room clapped and uh, they just left. <laughs> so it was very anticlimactic. Um, but in my case, they actually started working very quickly. So I, at that, by the time I came in, I had a lot of lymph nodes here in my uh, armpit. The one in my groin was really hurting. And uh, within 24 hours, they started melting. And uh, within seven days, basically all my palpable lymph nodes were gone. And I did develop something called a cytokine release syndrome, which is uh, a the body's reaction. There's a lot of different side effects, but in my case, it was fever and low blood pressure. Most people feel really sort of lousy, like the worst case of flu ever. Um, and I was hospitalized for just those three days from five days, five to eight. Um, but other than that, I was in a VRBO, condo and I stayed over at the hospital for a month and I didn't feel great, but I didn't feel awful. And amazingly, I was able to go back to work four weeks later, only working two days a week, um, which is unusual. I did extremely well. And I would say that not there's, you know, that's, that's relatively unusual, but on this, uh, I know a lot of people that had CAR-T now, and I know people who were actually working two weeks after CAR-T in the hospital. But Dr. Brody, can you overall give us a general description of CAR T cell therapy? What is it? What does it entail? I think that's a big question people people wonder about. When I describe CAR T cells uh, to my patients, they they think I'm kidding. It sounds like science fiction. Sounds like teleportation or you know light speed travel. Um, and then you have to know, yeah. And it maybe it's my own fault because I do kids with my patients sometimes. So that's why they think I'm kidding about this. But it's a real thing. And they think, oh, what decade? When will that be here? No, it's here now. It's already here. It's a real thing. Um, so a CAR T cell is a, we say, a combination of gene therapy and immune therapy. Literally, we take out some of a patient's immune cells. We send them somewhere, either to Santa Monica or a factory somewhere, where they turn them from normal healthy T cells, our own healthy immune T cells, and they insert this new gene called a CAR, chimeric antigen receptor, CAR. So they insert this CAR into the T cells. Now we call it CAR T cells. And then they FedEx, I'm exaggerating, but they ship that back to you um, and they reinfuse those CAR T cells uh, into the patient. It's not even quite as, as simple as that. The patients have to usually get some type of, I will say gentler chemotherapy before the CAR T cells are reinfused. Uh, we say we give that to sort of make room for the new cells to come in. Uh, it's a bit of metaphor, but but it, but it's conceptually fair. And uh, those CAR T cells, the gene that we put in the CAR uh, helps those T cells, those immune cells to go now traffic to your diffuse large B cell lymphoma and eliminate it probably more potently than any other single therapy uh, that we've ever developed, uh, close to some other immunotherapies now, uh, but it's it's quite amazing. We take out some immune cells, we put a new gene into them, we reinsert those CAR T cells, they go and melt away lymphoma. And they don't do it perfectly and they don't do it for 100% of people, but they induce remissions in a good majority of people. And depending on the setting, they may cure, it depends on the setting, but maybe 35, 40, maybe even 50%, but we usually say about 40% of patients. But again, it depends on sort of what's happened to that patient before and some other things about the patient, but they, you know, take what used to be an incurable disease because in 20, for Dr. Stacey Humphreys, we used to call that an incurable setting. We'd said, oh, third line, diffuse large B cell lymphoma, that's incurable. Uh, and here now we're curing, you know, 40% or more of those patients. So that's, it's miraculous and it's not science fiction. It's, it's a real thing. Dr. Brody, I think you can answer this question several ways, but I, I think in talking about uh, pros and cons, people do want to compare, right? Like what are the side effects? And then in terms of duration, not sure, maybe we can answer both. How long is the therapy itself? And then how long is the expected duration of response? 
um, pros and cons very broadly. I mean, the pro, uh, certainly if you compared it to what Dr. Stacey Humphreys described as the, the, the old standard before that, the chemo and the stem cell transplant, the pro is that it is both more effective for, especially for some patients and, um, uh, and gentler. I mean, you heard that Robin was out of work for two to four weeks, whereas out of, after the transplant, she was out of work for months and months and, and only on smoothies. So you can hear right there because when you ask doctors about efficacy, we can give you numbers, you know, 40%. But when you ask about side effects, it's a little, we kind of describe them in more nebulous, vague ways because it's not clear which number to give, the number of percentage of people that get an infection. I mean, there's so many numbers you could give, but that is a great metric, a great number, just how long were you out of work for um, or, you know, just unable to do the things you do. Um, you know, if you're retired, but you garden every day, how many weeks or months until you were gardening again? Um, so yeah, I think that's a great example. So the pros uh, compared to that old standard are better uh, and gentler. Um, but you know, let's acknowledge the cons as well. Uh, and Robin pointed at one, some of the side effects uh, and the most common uh, and maybe one of the scariest ones is this CRS, cytokine release syndrome. And it's basically just like having an infection, but there's no infection there. You have fevers and sometimes very low blood pressure, dangerously low blood pressure. And uh, even though Robin was only hospitalized for a few days, I think the more common thing nowadays is folks are hospitalized for sometimes a couple of weeks uh, on average. Sometimes it's a boring hospitalization, which is, which is the best kind of hospitalization, but just to watch for that side effect to see if it occurs. But sometimes those folks have to go to the intensive care unit just to treat that low blood pressure and fever. So that is one of the biggest side effects. And then one other scary side effect uh, is called ICONS, A-C-A-N-S, but, but mostly we just call it neurotoxicity. Uh, or encephalopathy. Mostly it just means there's a horrible problem with the brain and, and this side effect manifests in many different ways in hallucinations, loss of consciousness, all kinds of things. Uh, these things sound very scary. So I should first just preface it by saying there's kind of a very, when we talk about duration, a defined time course to these side effects. They, as, as Robin was saying, almost always happen within the first couple of weeks, just about always. There's a couple of rare exceptions that maybe happen on a third week, but they, they, they never happen you know, two months later. That, that's not a thing. Um, so, so Dr. Brody, let's talk about bispecific antibodies, which again, another very technical term. Um, some have described it very simplistically. Maybe the description would be more of an off-the-shelf CAR T option. And I think the larger theme here too that I've heard, and and let, we get a lot of questions from patients and care partners about, is will I have greater access if I don't live near a great, you know, large hospital or academic center um, with these bispecific antibodies? So, so Dr. Brody, what are they, and can you just talk also maybe loosely about some of the side effects? Sure, sure. Yeah, these are. I would say the most exciting and transformational thing in lymphoma and DLBCL, certainly in the last couple of years, or maybe you might argue, maybe ever, because their total impact they're going to have, my belief in the next few years is going to be unparalleled. Um, so bispecific antibody. So we talked about an antibody already. We talked about rituximab. So it's an antibody. What are antibodies? They're these magical little molecules, these big, long proteins that bind very specifically to one thing. Uh, and we make antibodies against COVID after we get a vaccine or get COVID, uh, and uh, a company can make antibodies against certain targets on lymphoma cells. So rituximab is an antibody against lymphoma, but it just binds lymphoma. So now some, I would say, brilliant pioneers from a few groups develop these bispecific antibodies. They bind two things. They bind lymphoma cells, and they bind one of your immune cells, one of your T cells, the same T cells we were making CAR T cells out of before. They basically bind them. Some people use a Lady and the Tramp with one spaghetti noodle metaphor here. Uh, and if you haven't seen the movie, anyway, it brings them together. And except uh, the only difference, instead of the kiss between the Lady and the Tramp, we say this is the kiss of death because the T cell kills uh, that lymphoma cell and kills it pretty well, just like the CAR T cell that we were talking about before. So in a way, it is sort of an off-the-shelf version of a T cell therapy, like the CAR T cell. We we're talking about some downsides of the CAR T cell, the practical downside, I mean, it's very cool that it's an individualized, you make the new medicine for each person. I send my T cells in, they send me back my CAR T cells. That's cool, but it's logistically, practically very difficult. So it takes a lot of time. Uh, how much time is a bit variable. It could take two or three weeks to make the product, but sometimes it takes a couple more weeks just to kind of plan the whole thing out. And sometimes it takes more weeks even just to get to see the doctor to plan that. So there can be real delays there, whereas these bispecific antibodies you just inject it right into the patient, no delay there. So they are in some ways practically a lot easier because uh, they are off the shelf. You don't have to make it for each person. Uh, and so the, the, the efficacy of them has been, I would say overall awesome. They are not perfect, 
but they are putting a, a big proportion of patients into complete remission. And some of those patients are staying in complete remission for years. Uh, so that's fantastic. Maybe the numbers are a little less um, amazing than CAR T cells in efficacy, but they are also, as we're saying, a lot easier. And you're asking them about possible side effects. Overall, they're a lot gentler. Um, those CAR T cells were causing sometimes the bad side effects, CRS or the neurotoxicity, in maybe 10 and 20% of patients, whereas these bispecifics causing those same side effects and maybe one to three percent, the, the bad version of those side effects, and maybe one to three percent of patients. So that already opens up a lot of opportunity because some patient that maybe was not eligible for CAR T because it would have been too uh, scary, maybe they could be eligible for bispecifics. And then also you're asking about just the kind of ease of access. Yeah, CAR T cells are available at a limited number of centers. Uh, that can be tricky because uh, you're not just going there for one day to get the therapy. You're there for a while, um, as Robin was saying thing. And, um, and bispecifics should be available, maybe not today, because they're really, they were just FDA approved uh, in June, basically, uh, over the past couple of months, May and June. Uh, so they may not be available everywhere today. So we don't want to oversell that. But they can be available everywhere. And they're available at most major centers now today. Right. And um, now that you're mentioning the, the two approvals that, again, yeah, very recent. So uh, epcaritimab or epkinley and glofitimab or columv, I hope I'm not butchering those, um, you know, they're newer, they're newly approved. It's great as new options just to share with patients, but how would someone know what questions to ask for, uh, you know, whether they're, you know, a good candidate for bispecifics and or which, which option to go for? And, and you can also cover the fact that, as we know, it was approved for later lines of treatment um, and, even after approval, they're still in clinical trial because everyone likes to try and move it up earlier, right, in lines of treatment. So yeah, very exciting. These two medicines were just FDA approved in the last couple of months, epcaritimab and glofitimab. There actually was one other that was approved for follicular lymphoma uh, last at the end of last year, which was uh, mosonetuzumab. But just to point out that there's lots of these getting studied and approved now, there will be several more approved over the next uh, you know year. Uh, and yes, they are approved as a sort of a plan C, a third line therapy when plan A or plan B don't work uh, well enough. Uh, so yeah, you know, if you, if a patient asks the question, is this the right therapy for me? Uh, tough and detailed question, but the first thing you want to make sure is that the doctor that you are working with is familiar with the option. Maybe we didn't predict this, but the punchline was those two medicines, epicritimab and glofitimab, in terms of the, the punchline, how effective they are, how safe they are, are more similar than different. They're incredibly similar. For example, like the complete remission rate uh, for both of them was exactly 39%. What are the chances of that, you know, of taking a 100-sided die and rolling and getting 39 twice? And, and also the side effects, those high-grade bad side effects were about 3% in, with both of those medicines. So the punchline is they are more similar than different. There are little nuanced differences, so I'll mention a couple of them. Uh, one of them is that the epcritimab is given uh, subcutaneously, just as a shot, whereas the glofitimab is given kind of the more conventional way, uh, intravenously. So that's a little difference. It's not a huge big deal. Uh, and also sort of the timing of them is a bit different. The epcritimab has sort of more visits and they might go on for longer. Uh, and the glofitimab, maybe fewer visits and, and is designed, the recipe is for it to stop after about nine months. So those are little nuanced differences. It doesn't give you an answer of which one is better. They're actually extremely similar. We do ultimately make a decision for each patient, but they're pretty similar overall. Yeah, that's exciting for sure. I appreciate that, Dr. Brody. Um, Robin, you lead also like this huge group online in the CAR T cell therapy space. I'm sure you get so many questions. Just curious if you've started to get questions about bispecifics and also just you, you've seen what people are uh, concerned about. What are What is your take on where you think bispecifics might uh, you know, fill a gap or be a good option for folks? I think one of the things I always say is every patient is unique. And um, in the community hospitals, most of the oncologists are very overwhelmed with trying to take care of more of your bread and butter type of uh, therapy. So I really don't see biospecifics going into the community hospitals anytime soon, at least in the more rural areas. It's going to have to be in a center city and often on a transplant unit. Um, so for biospecifics and CAR-T, I see them as very similar. As far as on the CAR-T site, we do have people who fail. Uh, there's, again, really about 40% have long-term uh, relucimate, and then there's everyone else. Uh, so what uh, I, I think that, that most of the people after the second or third round should see a specialist, and they should find a lymphoma specialist, uh, and then 
they'll have to decide what they would rather have or what's best for them with a new bias. So it changes the whole gamut. Um, so I think everything's very early. Um, I think patients need to be their own advocate and have to be honest. Uh, as much as they would like to stay in uh, rural Montana uh, and be with their family doctor who's and their oncologist is great, but if you have something serious like this, you really have to be your own advocate and you'll have to travel. All right, we're at the last moment now here where we'd love to understand sort of the final takeaway um, from each of our panelists um, in terms of maybe the most important thing or or just the one thing that they'd like for you to walk away from um, tonight with? Messages that we are, patients with lymphoma are unlucky to have lymphoma, but so lucky to be here today with that lymphoma. Whereas, you know, 20 years ago, we didn't have nearly access to medicines that cure patients and keep them in long-term remission to go and live their lives, hopefully just like they were before. And we only have those new medicines because patients join clinical trials so if patients join clinical trials today, they sometimes are getting access to the medicines of the future. These new bispecifics that just got FDA approved, our patients were getting access to them three years ago because they did this slightly scary thing and asked, hey, are there any clinical trials available? And for some of them, thank goodness, because uh, they're still here to tell their story today. I really want to tell people there are hope. Don't give up hope. Make sure you ask questions. Feel free to get other opinions. Really good doctors are not insulted when you get another opinion. Just take my word for it. <laughs>